All right, let's talk exoplanets. The search for life is probably what drives us most and interests us most with these exoplanets, but there's lots of interesting and amazing worlds out there for us to learn about. We're going to discuss what's necessary for life as we know it and have a little discussion about that before we launch into our search for exoplanets. We'll discover what they are, um, some exoplanet uh, data as far as what we've discovered so far, methods of detection, and then we'll go through some exoplanet types. We've uh, found some pretty interesting things out there. First, uh, life. So if we look for life in the solar system, of course, Earth is, has a unique set of characteristics that sustain life on Earth. Can we find those places, other places in the solar system? Well, the other places in the solar system are pretty extreme and the chances are low, but the best opportunity for life outside of Earth might be on places like Europa and Enceladus. Europa is one of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Enceladus is one of the, the moons of Saturn, and both of them have shown a water ice crust with a saltwater ocean underneath. And we think that saltwater ocean in each of these might interface with a rocky ocean bottom that has possible volcanic vents. And where you have volcanic vents underwater, you have, first of all, water, you have heat energy, which provides the energy, and you have nutrients. This could possibly sustain microbial life. Places like Titan, even though they're very cold, have a, uh, have a slim possibility, uh, but they don't have liquid water. Titan, of course, has a, an atmosphere similar to ours, uh, but and it has a hydrocarbon cycle, like we have a water cycle. It has liquid hydrocarbons flowing around and raining and so forth, but um, not a lot of water there. It's too cold for that. And Mars, <coughs> excuse me, Mars has a uh, prospect for life in its past, but not so much today. Uh, Mars had liquid water in the past and may have been uh, warmer. Uh, we do see evidence for water in the past, so that means life could possibly have existed there. But because of the thin atmosphere, we know that uh, life couldn't exist at the surface of Mars. Uh, it's just too harsh. Earth, of course, has a perfect mix of all the favorable conditions for life. You need to be in the habitable zone around your planet, in other words, or around your star. In other words, you need to be in a spot where liquid water can exist and water can exist in all three phases. Your, your atmosphere has to be thick enough to protect from the ultraviolet radiation and the X-ray radiation that comes in from the, from the star that you're around. Uh, and Earth has a nice, perfect, thick atmosphere for this. Uh, you need to have oxygen in your environment and, and uh, other elements like water and water vapor. And a magnetic field helps a lot. The solar wind or the stellar wind that comes from your local star uh, is producing a stream of charged particles that when they, they hit a magnetic field, the magnetic field directs that away from the planet. So Earth has that. You need, of course, a liquid metallic interior and rapid rotation to make that um, possible. This is what we look for when we look for conditions favorable for life. Now, obviously, no, nothing in our solar system is like this, so we have to look elsewhere uh, to find this. Just to highlight these conditions, noting that the habitable zone is in green in this diagram showing that anywhere in, in the, within that is too hot, anywhere beyond that is too cold. Sometimes they call it the Goldilocks zone because it's just right uh, outside the uh, star. The atmosphere has to be adequately thick enough for liquid water um, to provide UV for protection and even burning up meteors. Um, you commonly frequent, uh, planets frequently interact with space debris that uh, needs a thick enough atmosphere to burn it up so it doesn't keep pummeling the surface. And uh, we can actually detect atmospheric thickness when we see planets in, in some of the modes of detection. And we'll talk about that. We can actually also see the composition of some of these uh, different planets out there uh, by their uh, spectrum, the spectrum they give off when they go and move in front of their star. Things like uh, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water vapor are visible in an atmosphere. And that magnetic field, here's a visual of, of protection of, from the solar winds that would be directed around the planet by this magnetic field. 
Here's a picture of the surface of Venus. Of course, Earth, the Moon, Mars, Titan. Nowhere in our solar system are the conditions right for life except for Earth, so we need to look elsewhere. That's where exoplanets come in. An exoplanet is any planet beyond our solar system. It can be any combination of planet types orbiting any kind of various stars. Um, one thing we've learned from our discovery of exoplanets is that um, there's a big variety of stuff out there. It's pretty neat, actually, to see uh, some of the different uh, kinds of planets that we see and the different kinds of stars, the situations that we may not have dreamed, dreamt up have, are, are out there. Uh, the very first exoplanet ever discovered is called 51 Pegasi b. It's uh, orbiting the star of 51 Pegasi. Uh, it is a Jupiter-sized planet that's as close as Mercury, so we call that a hot Jupiter. And th this was discovered in 1995 by Swiss astronomers. They got a Nobel Prize for it. Um, but this really kind of like was the official dis beginning of the start of the search for exoplanets, although uh, some work was done before this. Since then, over 4,000 exoplanets have been confirmed and thousands more awaiting confirmation and likely out there. Worlds have come in all shapes and sizes from these hot Jupiters to the cold gas giants and the bigger planets, large ice or ocean worlds, and rocky planets like our own. In 2008, NASA dedicated their search for uh, extrasolar planets with their Kepler Space Telescope. It was outfitted specifically to search for exoplanets. And from that one, almost 3,000 exoplanets were confirmed. In, in 2018, they replaced Kepler with a new one called TESS, which is a Transitioning Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And it is outfitted as well to uh, find exoplanets. So let's look at some of the modes that we detect exoplanets. Um, there are basically five major uh, exoplanet detection uh, methods that out there, uh, the most successful of which is the transit method. These numbers after each of these methods show how many exoplanets have been found using this method. And obviously, the transit method has been the most successful. Doppler shift is also very successful with 837 exoplanets being discovered in this way. Um, and then they have some really interesting uh, gravitational microlensing and uh, astro. Astro astrometry uh, in order to find exoplanets. Uh, this is really kind of going outside the box thinking, but they found some uh, so with some pretty unique methods. And then direct imaging is just plain old seeing the exoplanet around the star. We found 51 like that. I'm going to go through each of these briefly here. The transit method is where um, we are looking at a star. It's a constant brightness, but what happens is the brightness actually dips for a short time and then comes back to normal again. This happens because the planet is making a transit across the surface. That's pretty interesting. And we could actually determine some pretty neat things about the actual planet just by this transit and the spectrum we get from it. Another mode is by Doppler shift, that when you discover a star and you look at the star very closely, the star will actually turn a little bit bluer than it should be, and then a little redder than it should be, and then a little bluer than it should be. And the reason it does this is because the star is wobbling. It's actually going through a little circular orbit itself. A star has a wobble because uh, the planets around it tug on it. Uh, our star does this. Our star has a bit of a wobble because of the planets uh, orbiting it. Uh, and you can actually detect this uh, in the light signatures of stars. And so this is the Doppler shift. When the planet is uh, tugged towards us, we get a blue shift of light. And when the planet is tugged away from us, we get a red shift of light. And just by how much the, the blue shift and the red shift takes place, we can determine the mass of the planets surrounding that star. So it's pretty nifty. <clears throat> Another very clever technique is called gravitational microlensing. And here's what happens. What we do is we look at a star. Say we're looking at this orange star here. And as it passes in front of another star in the distance, a little maybe a little bit brighter, what will happen is the star brightness will go up, up, up as the two stars join forces to make light together uh, that reaches our eyes in our telescopes. And then when it passes on, it, it moves on. <clears throat> and the brightness dims again. 
in a gravitational microlensing situation when a planet is present, what will happen is you'll get that um, spike. And then as it moves down, you get a uh, an anomalous spike in the brightness. And then it goes down again. This anomalous spike in the brightness as it's going down is indicative of a planet being thrown into the mix. The planet's gravity will actually microlens the light and have a brief bright um, spell. And so you'll, here's, here's the normal situation of uh, the stars combining brightness. As they start to dim, you have the spike in brightness again. And this gravitational microlensing, we've discovered 108 exoplanets using this method. And direct imaging has shown us 51 exoplanets. We blot out this, the central star, and, and you can see the other planets that surround the star. And we've found 51 planets in such ways. And lastly, uh, we talked about um, the Doppler shift measurable because of, a, uh, of planets surrounding a star. A star also just plain old wobble. So you can actually, even without looking at the Doppler shift, you can see the wobble of the planet. Its actual physical movement in space is wobbling, and you can determine that there is a planet or planets around it based on this wobble. And pretty interesting. It's called astrometry. Combining all those methods, you can see that um, as we started in 1995, things started to get to heat up. And in 2008, Kepler was launched, and we had uh, lots of good observations. We had a really great year in 2014 and 2016. Then came along TESS, and TESS has been consistently finding planets, and we're still starting to find more planets as of April 29th of 2021. So that's how we detect them. Now, what do we detect? Well, this is kind of the fun and exciting part. These are the types of exoplanets we find. In general, scientists have found lots of very interesting worlds out there that are very different than our own or what we're used to in our solar system. But what they found is there are basically four big general categories of planets, and maybe six if you add uh, a couple to the bottom of this list, but they are gas giants, Neptune-like planets, which we call Neptunian, Super Earths, which are about uh, two times or greater the size of Earth, and then terrestrial planets. These are ones like our own. There's also some categories such as subterran, uh, like uh, planets that would be like the size of Mars, and um, even smaller ones that are Mercury-like. They have another category for that. But for the most part, these are the four main categories. First off, the gas giants are planets like the size of Saturn or Jupiter, and we found many out there like that. In fact, these are a little bit easier to detect because they're so big. Um, here's a picture of Kepler-7b. This is a large planet, even bigger than Jupiter. And our galaxy has billions of these gas giants in them. Uh, we found lots and lots of them. Um, what's interesting about this is that if you find a, we found hot Jupiters, which are uh, these gas giants very close to their sun, kind of burning up in the sun's uh, atmosphere as it goes around and round. And then we found these gas giants that are far out away from the star. But uh, we can also find and look for gas giants that are in the habitable zone around their star. Now, life might not exist on the gas giant planet, per se, but the moon's orbiting that gas giant. And we're now we're talking. Uh, you could actually have moons uh, that orbit gas giants in the habitable zone, and those moons could potentially have the, the fixins for, uh, to support life as we know it. Uh, like the farthest moon of Endor, for all you Star Wars fans. All right, uh, the first sun, uh, and, and here is an example of a large gas giant that we found. This is the very first exoplanet officially discovered, 51 Pegasi b. Um, this one is a hot Jupiter. It is uh, found in a star that surrounds, uh, it's 51 Pegasi is very similar to our own sun. Here's our sun and 51 Pegasi for comparison on the bottom right of this diagram. Uh, as well, on the bottom left, you can see a comparison between 51 Pegasi b and Jupiter. And you can see uh, the differences there, but <clears throat> very interesting, right? The next class of planet would be Neptunian. And these are significantly smaller than the gas giants, but still bigger yet planets, things like Neptune and Uranus in size. These are very hydrogen and helium dominated in their outer atmospheres and probably have rocky cores. Um, one discovered recently from NASA's TESS uh, orbiter 
in 2018 uh, found a sub-Neptunian planet that's three times bigger and 23 times more massive than the Earth. Now this one, it's about 53 light years from Earth orbiting its star. And it, the, its star is actually about the size of the mass of our sun. It's about 0.8 solar masses. So that's pretty interesting. The planet itself is about 23 Earth masses and about three times the size of Earth. Uh, so uh, pretty big. And its temperature then, because it's so close to its star, it's, its temperature is probably about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, it's not an ice giant. It would be a Neptunian planet that's close to its star. Now, when the planets get a little bit smaller, now we're getting into the super Earth category. Super Earths are basically two times the size of Earth to about 10 times the size of Earth. And then we would consider these super Earth planets. And they can be um, made of gas or rock or a combination of both. Um, they can be water, complete water planets or complete ice planets. Uh, one such planet, Kepler 452b, uh, was found around uh, a star very similar to ours. Uh, here's Kepler 452b compared to our sun for size comparison. You can see those two there, so they're pretty similar. And Kepler 452b is very similar to Earth. It's a super Earth, so it's about twice the size of Earth, but nonetheless pretty similar. Uh, we, it likely has a rocky surface, and its orbit is about 385 days. So it's a little bit, it's pretty close to its star given the star's size, but its year is similar to ours. So, and the temperature may be similar. So this is a really compelling planet that was discovered in 2015. And most recently, TESS has also, actually not TESS, it's been, it was the, um, boy, what was this? I think this was the... Um, Spitzer found this one, but this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. These are examples of terrestrial planets, Earth size and smaller uh, exoplanets composed of rock, silicate rock, uh, water, and carbon, very similar to the makeup of our own planet. Um, I mentioned this one, the TRAPPIST-1 system, because seven terrestrial planets near Earth size all potentially having water at the surface or perhaps water or ice or, or water vapor found around an M-class star, which is a cooler red star. Now, in order to explain this um, comparison, uh, the star is very much smaller. So these planets uh, would have to be pretty close to the star to be in the habitable zone, and they are. Um, this is the TRAPPIST-1 system with its little, little star right here. For comparison, the sun is shown right here. So you can see the sun is much bigger uh, than this star. But this star is a little star. And these planets are blown up in size. They're not this big compared to their star. But you can see where they're at around the star. If you compare this um, size of this solar system here, this TRAPPIST-1 system, to our own solar system, it would fit right here. It would fit within the Mercury, the orbit of Mercury. But again, remember that sun is that star that around the Trappist is very small. Here's a better, perhaps a better comparison. Here, here's the Trappist One system with its small star and its planets that are orbit around it. Noting that the habitable zone is within the uh, Trappist E. Trappist F and Trappist G planets. H might be an ice world, and B and C might and D might be a little too hot, but nonetheless, they might still have liquid water. Uh, compared to our solar system, again, it's small, but our habitable zone right here with Earth uh, at the middle of our habitable zone, Mars toward the outer part. If you compare the actual size of the planets and density, uh, the Trappist planets are a little bit lower in density, indicating a, a greater likelihood of, of water present on the planet. Trappist E is very similar in its density that, to that of Earth, and it would be, um, as far as the star is concerned, maybe a little less luminous. Uh, Trappist D, a little less dense, but uh, right in the uh, sort of comparable luminosity to what Earth receives. So those are very, that's a very compelling set of uh, terrestrial planets that we found out there. So we found uh, uh, our big gas giant planets. We found our Neptunian. We found our super Earth. And here are our terrestrial. Uh, they're, like I said, subterran and other, other, other types of planets. But there's lots of different interesting worlds out there, things that we may not even have dreamt up. Um, I wanted to close today with showing you a few of those. 
here's a handful of strange exoplanets. <clears throat> From what we've seen and know, uh, the first one in the upper left here, this HD 18977-3b, this one likely has rain moving sideways. The winds are so great that the rain is moving sideways, and the rain consists of glass, like hardened up silica pellets. Uh, pretty crazy, right? Wouldn't think of that. Here's another one that you might not dream up. Uh, 55 Cancri, Cancri E. This planet is thought to have about a third of its interior made up of just solid diamond. Uh, so that's pretty crazy. Uh, the bottom left here, TRES 2B. This one has a very, very low reflective surface. Its surface is super dark. And then the bottom right here, Gliese 436B. It's thought to be a giant ball of ice, but having a surface that is flaming. Uh, so that's very, very interesting, right? Crazy. Uh, so if you can, the, beyond our wildest dreams are th the types of exoplanets that we're finding out there. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is our look at exoplanets.